Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show where I talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about the latest episode of Gotham, as well as the latest episode of Arrow. Like always, if I'm talking about something that you want to listen to, you can always look in the description down below. I include a time when I start talking about each of the respective shows. So, for example, if you want to hear what I say about this week's episode of Gotham, you can skip to what I say about this week's episode of Arrow. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is this week's episode of Gotham. A very good episode. A a lot of stuff goes down in this episode. We have the resurrection of uh, Ra's al Ghul, which is kind of interesting because I, well, Rich, I thought, because I still wasn't clear on what his whole motive was, like getting Bruce to kill him. I thought that, like, I figured it was all part of a plan, but I didn't know what the grand scheme of the plan was. I was like, no, like, legitimately, he needed to die, and the only person that would be able to kill him was Bruce. That was what it was all about, because for him, he wouldn't, like, he lived for such a long time, and it's like, okay, the league's become corrupt. It's not what it should be, so he did leave everything intentionally for Barbara, because he thought, you know, what he saw in her. Obviously, later on, he tries to play mind games with her. It's like, no, 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 no. All that person, I, you think you or her? Oh, she's not special. She was just some whore. But it's like, obviously, she means something to you, because you drew that painting, and you still kept it. It seems like that's something from a lifetime ago many lifetimes ago in your regard, but it's like, obviously you kept it, so, uh, but obviously you just needed to say what he needed to say to get into Barbara's head, but, because Barbara wasn't reconstructing the League like he wanted to do. Like I said, it's just kind of interesting when you compare this League compared to the one in Arrow, because it's like, it's just kind of an interesting, like, because it is nice Interesting that it's kind of entering a civil war situation between the two different sides. Obviously, there's a side that wants Raish to lead, and then there's the other side that wants Barbara to lead, you know? So, and this all happened because Tabitha was kind of like trying to get the power away from um, Barbara because she wanted, you know, before Barbara ended up getting herself killed because Barbara would literally be in the middle of a civil war, so. Poor Bruce kind of was the instrument of bringing this all back. And because this put a big weight on Bruce, too, because it meant, like, he would have to be the one to kill Rich. Because it's like, only I can do it. Um, I did appreciate the little thing between him and, um, not the, between, um, Alfred and, uh, Tabitha. Uh, that play, them playing, uh, getting that dude at the uh, museum's attention so that they could steal the uh, knife back. I thought that was just kind of a nice little play acting between them. Have they ever really interacted before? They had to have, like, at some point in time, Tabitha and Alfred, they've had to cross paths. It wasn't, it's, no, like, they've definitely crossed paths before. He even references, it's like, yeah, they'll so stab us in the back this time. I was like, when was that last time? I don't remember. Nevertheless, um, playing being in a couple, too, that's got to be a little awkward and stuff. But uh, nevertheless, a big thing we learned in this episode, too, is the fact that the matter is, what it means to be the demon's head, like, what, like, you've never really known before now, like, because, like, there's a whole thing about what, like, you know, Raish sees and knows, it's like, oh, I thought that was all some prophecy, which is, like, maybe to some extent, sure, but it's, like, it's also because as the demon's head, he can see the past, present, and future, it's like, where the hell did that come from, that's still something we haven't necessarily found out, like, I mean, obviously, this goes back a very, very long time. Obviously, Raish wasn't the first demon's head. But it's like, what does this power, what does this entity, like, the demon's head, where does that power stem from? I remember they went into Raish's past, but I don't really remember them ever explaining, like, where that all originated from. I don't know. That's I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's like, holy crap, you have all that power? And even then, it's like, well, we still don't know everything that the demon's head can do. Because Barbara never got an opportunity to tap into everything. She did kind of, at the last minute, kind of tap into, like, the the time ability of being able to see past, present, and future kind of all at once. And like I said, that's a pretty neat ability. So that's why he was so fixated on Bruce, because he could see. But maybe... Maybe it took these circumstances to allow his ability to push even further. Because maybe he, well, because he was so focused on finding out that, oh, Bruce could be the potential end of him. But maybe it's a situation of once he saw that, he never be bothered trying to see beyond that because that's all he wanted. But now, like, you know, it's like ultimately when he gets the power back because Barbara sacrificed it to save Tabitha's life because she saw what it was like, which, which, like I said, is always interesting. Because Tabitha kind of does the same thing for Barbara in a sense, like, Tabitha has Barbara's back. It's like, yeah, I didn't want you to have a demon's head power. Kind of still don't want you to have it, but the fact of the matter is, like, you've never really doubted yourself before. And we've had our problems, but, you know, that's what she's always admired about Barbara, she, her convictions. And it's like, if you're going all in for this, so am I. I got your back all the way. And so, it is nice to see that, you know... I do appreciate that the relationship isn't completely demolished because I thought it was like, oh man, they're just going to completely be on opposite sides. It's like, no, they came together because, you know, that 
I wonder if there's going to still be like something between them. There was before, but I'm curious like where that all stands now because of the whole Butch situation. So is it just like a friendship thing or is it an intimate thing? Like, I don't know. They're, they're partners in crime in this situation. So it's like, we're sirens. We in, we're in this together. So type of thing. So. I mean, Selena kind of bailed out because she's like, really? I handed you the knife because I thought you had a greater plan. It's like, no, you're just going to draw him in and stab him. Really? That's your plan? Because for her main reason for doing it is because she didn't want Bruce to have to live with that. And she brings up the good point, too, because it's like Bruce nearly fell apart the last time when he thought he killed Rage. It's like, yeah, I mean, because that's what I was thinking. Like, would it undo what Bruce did before? And I don't think it necessarily undoes it, but I think it's going to motivate him to never cross that line again. He was only doing it this time because he felt like he has to, because it's like Rage is a da is a darkness that cannot be left unchecked. So, but I'm curious to see what he does in the end, because I feel like he won't. I mean, for right now, he doesn't actually have a means of doing it because Rage broke the blade. Which I guess is one of those situations of like, like maybe some of like the magic behind the blade is still there. Or maybe like it's kind of like a spell where like the entire blade has to be fully intact for the magic to kind of activate and allow someone to kill Rage. I don't know. Because she and, uh, because Selena ended up bringing up a good point in this episode. And it's like, the fact of the matter is like, who cares about Sai? Because it's like, oh, her loyalty is kind of being split between her. Bruce and her loyalty to Barbara and Tabitha, but it's like, why do we have to? Why do there have to be sides in this situation? Which is kind of interesting because it also fits Catwoman so perfectly because she fits that. She is between that that lane between hero and villain. She always skates that area, that gray area, and I think that's kind of a nice touch. You know, like not completely shoving it in your face, but kind of recognizing that. I mean, it's always, I and mean, that's always been an aspect of Selena's character, but I feel like it's really shining through and it's because it's like, there's a bigger threat we have to worry about, which I think that's going to be something we see kind of continuing forward too with this whole situation. I mean, what's interesting about that, and it's kind of what I was bringing up earlier, is the fact is that Raish is back and he does like Bruce. He sees what Bruce's life could potentially be. And he's talking about the fact that matters. He sees something. He sees a fire, a uh, cataclysmic event that will befall upon Gotham. At first, I was like, okay. I was like, oh, could this be Joker? Could this be someone else? And the way he's saying it, it's like, no, it's going to be me. I'm going to burn the city, purify it. And from it, you will rise as, as Gotham's dark knight. Um, if you survive it, that is. And it's just so interesting because I think he sees what Bruce could become and it's like it intrigues him. It's like, I'm going to be the one that pushed you to become who you're destined to be, which has always been something before. But I think I think now after everything that's happened off the path that Bruce has taken so far, I think Raish can see it a lot more clearly because he's not so motivated by his own death anymore that he sees Bruce's future, you know, so... By what I guess like, that's also going to include the Civil War because like even though Barbara is no longer the demon's head, the sisters of the League follow her because it's like no like the fact is you fought and you gave up those powers for someone else. You didn't just fight for yourself. You fought for someone else. You gave up those powers to protect Tabitha, and for that they will serve her. So Barbara isn't out of this fight yet, and neither is Bruce. Like both of them, Barbara more so willing more so because she. Feels like it's her destiny, which I am curious to find out more about. I want Rache to kind of explain like what that is about. Is Barbara a reincarnation of that lady from that? I mean, he went out of his way to choose her amongst anyone. I feel like I, I legitimately thought the one he was aiming for was Bruce, but maybe he thought like, uh, I can't get to Bruce. You know, maybe even then he knew it was never going to be Bruce's destiny that it was supposed to be Barbara's. It's like, oh, here I am. I meet this woman who looks like someone I knew in the past. So I don't know. Hopefully, Rachel kind of explained that uh, later on. It also sucks, too, because, like, Bruce and uh, suddenly were about to kiss, and he's like, oh, sorry for interrupting. I even love when Barbara stabbed him with a knife initially. He's like, ouch. And it's just kind of like, I forgot that he kind of has a little bit of charisma to him. Like, he's kind of a jokey uh, villain, which I really appreciate. Because my only experience with him has been, obviously, him from Arrow, and even, like, the Batman animated series from the 90s. He was very jokey. Not, no, he wasn't even jokey in that, like, from my recollection, which is, I barely remember it. He was kind of a serious dude, so I thought it was kind of nice to add some levity and just to, like, his darkness and just kind of, like, I don't know, you know that... That charm, that evil charm where you just like when they have like a devilish small innervation, like, ooh, I, I sense the bad guy in you and I love it type of thing. I don't know. That's just kind of how my mind works on those uh, situation, but still. 
very interesting developments. Like I said, learning more about the demon head in that regard. Because I didn't know something else came with it like that besides the whole, like, oh, yeah, like, I mean, the immortality thing stems from, like, the Lazarus pit, I'm, I'm assuming, but maybe it also stems from the demon head, too. Maybe it's, like, a one-two thing where it's, like, the Lazarus pit can heal your wounds. It does, well, I mean, because, I mean, because the fact that, well, because you have to continuously drink from the Lazarus pit to keep up the immortality. It definitely heals wounds, but, like, I don't know. Maybe his being the deep, maybe in this continuity, and maybe just in Batman continuity altogether, it's not just about the Lazarus pit. Yes, it can heal wounds and bring people back from the dead, but, which is kind of interesting. Why? I guess because it is kind of like a curse slash spell, like Bruce killing him meant Bruce was the only way to make it bring him back. No, even the Lazarus pit wouldn't. Because we, we haven't seen it since like season three's finale. That's the last time we've seen the Lazarus pit. So I'm like, w did they move it? Like, what happened with that? Did it dry? Because I don't remember. Did it dry up like when Raish died? Like, since, well, no, because then like, why did? Well, I mean, the main source could have dried up, but it's like, but then there's the one that uh, Bruce and Lucius had that um, Ivy Soul. So it's like, obviously, it's not completely gone in that regard. Maybe it's just I don't know. Hit like I said, maybe they moved it and it's just hidden away. Maybe it just comes up with the demon's head's abilities of being able to kind of, like, wherever the demon head is, the Lazarus Pit follows. And kind of like, a, it's like a mystical, uh, well, mystical magical pool. I don't know. It's kind of interesting because you have all, like, this huge major, like, well, cataclysm. You have, like, this big, big, big plot. And then you also have, like, the smaller plots in Gotham, which I think is just kind of interesting because it's like, oh, I'm, you have all this league and... Demon head stuff, and he also has like the other side of the episode, which deals with uh, uh, Riddler, which I thought was kind of an interesting take on like the whole Riddler situation, because obviously like he's asking Lee for, it. he's like, oh, like how do you feel about me and stuff like that, and it's like, oh, are you just using me and stuff like that, which they've been like robbing banks together, which she kind of proposed last episode, but it's so interesting, and then like. Ed pops up in the reflections, and it's like, oh, the vice versa. For such a long time, Ed has been on the receiving end, and now he gets to be the one to dish it out. He's like, Do oh, is it, it's going to get to the point. It's going to be hard to tell who's who. You say you're the Riddler, but the fact of the matter is you actually care. You're doing everything to impress, you know, Lee. Eventually to the point, it's going to be, is that you or is this me? And like, what, you know, at what point you won't even be able to distinguish who's who anymore. And it's a, such an interesting take on his character. Like I said, it's always been the Riddler, that darker side of him kind of taking over. And now we see that Ed is kind of fighting back in a sense of like, I'm still here. So, because he still hasn't found that complete and utter union. Maybe this will be the season where he does find it. It seems like we're etching towards that potentially. Um, because I love that even Oswald is like, really, dude? Come on. Obviously, she's just using you. You can't be that much of an idiot. Which, after that conversation, he's like, no, 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 no. I've got to, I've got to get rid of this. I'm a bury Enigma forever. And so he wants to work with, um, Penguin and Grundy, Butch. But it turns out that's a double bluff. And it's like, wait, what? Which is kind of interesting. It's so weird, because the fact that you have Riddler being like, you come after Lee, you're coming after me. And it's like, oh. Even after everything they've been through, he's still kind of like, yeah, I don't want a problem with you, Oswald. Know that this isn't personal. This is just me doing what I want to for the woman I love. And it's like, oh, that's sweet. But it's like, huh. Which is kind of interesting because of like the back and forth him and Oswald have always had. But I guess that's always been Ed, never the Riddler. So kind of separating that difference. But even Lee's like, why are you doing that? He's like, the fact that... And he points out something I thought was so fascinating... Um, I mean, I kind of had to figure because, like, like, because Penguin used these exact words. He's like, oh, she's infecting you with um, almost like a virus. And the moment he brought that, it's like, oh, yeah, like, oh, is that supposed to be like a, like a callback to, like, Lee when she was under, the, like, the Tetch virus? But then, like, that kind of plays, a, I guess it was kind of foreshadowing because it's what Ed talks about. It's like, basically, ever since season two, like, Lee, the end of season two, Lee's dark side, like, that Tetch virus brought up something deep, dark within her. And that's something got lodged even further free when she shot Sophia. And so, and because it's something that comes up in conversation with Jim, because it's like, Jim's like, oh, you can always talk to me. You can't just try and do everything you can for absolution. Like, you, you can't bring on other people's problems. And she says, Jim doesn't understand. And I think, I don't know, it looks like there's a part of her that wants Jim to understand. Maybe there's a part of her that feels like Jim would understand uh, because he's struggled with his dark side. But 
Lee hasn't struggled with it. I think now she's kind of fully embracing it once again. And Ed's like, I, I finally understand you. And he's like, and that, and I think that's what draw, like, even though Lee is just using him, he realizes, like, he's the only one that understands her. It's like, you know, you're not afraid of this darkness in you. You are embracing it. You love it. And he's like, I love it. You may not love me, but he's like, you will eventually. Like, I'll make, I'll make sure, kind of show you that, you know, I am worth you loving type of thing. So, that took a turn I wasn't expecting because I always figured I was like, oh, Lee's just using him, which is like, which is sad because I'm like, oh, that's just her furthering down the dark path anyway. But it's like, no, like, I, it, I guess they're going to cause a little bit of chaos themselves. I mean, we do see the episode with well, that side of the story ending with Jim arresting her, which is interesting because she's kind of like, oh, I can handle Jim, which is interesting because it's like, yeah, like, is, is he literally about to go through a. Sophia uh, part two, which interestingly enough, she, let's not forget, she isn't dead. She's got a bullet in her head. She's in a coma. Not less race decides to go resurrect her and, and need, I don't, I don't know. I'm like, I'm just curious to see like what his plans entail entirely. Cause obviously like Sophia isn't done with this story, but I'm curious to see what they do with her. I mean, like I said, we saw what happened to Butch. So not unless someone does that to Sophia too. Like I'm curious, like how she's going to come back. You know, like, under what circumstances. I am also curious, too, with the Joker being set up, you know, uh, last episode, will he make an appearance this season or not? Like I said, I'm wondering, is he part of that chaos? Like I said, the way Rach was talking about it, it's like, he's the one, but not less. he was just kind of like, oh, like, this is going to happen anyway, but I'm going to use it as an opportunity to stoke the fire within you, Bruce, as well, to bring forth my Dark Knight. Well, not my Dark Knight, Gotham's Dark Knight. Because before it was all kind of about making Bruce his heir, making Bruce his Dark Knight. But now it's like, nope, you'll be Gotham's Dark Knight. But it's like, but what would be the purpose of that? I guess maybe it's also because he sees the potential future that Bruce creates when he becomes Batman, essentially. You know, it's like it unlocks so many potentials in this world by him stepping forward from the shadows or stepping into the shadows, I guess, in this particular case, you know, or tiptoeing that line. I don't know what would be the perfect phrase to kind of represent that but i'm i'm just curious to see what happens like getting back to what i was bringing up or i kind of went on a tangent it's a whole situation with you know jim it's like he it, it's always kind of a soft spot when it comes to lee because she has a lot of control and a lot of sway over him it's like it's always been a thing like amongst anyone she has probably the biggest control over him and i think when it comes to her, his feelings have a tendency to kind of get in the way. He kind of, I think he's trying to fight it. He's trying to make good on that. And I'm thinking when it's all said and done, when it's not Sophia that's going to do it, I think it's going to be Lee that's going to expose him now that I'm thinking about it. Because like the moment, because she knows about like, you know, Jim's secrets and stuff like that. So she could end up exposing him. So that could be something we see in the long run. It's like, oh, you, you know, Sophia, you know, Sophia was trying to do the same thing. Well, I'm doing it too, which obviously he's still trying to stop her, but maybe he'll try. It won't work the same way because like, well, he actually legitimately loves um, Lee, which obviously he cared about Sophia too, but you know, like Lee's kind of in her own, like a league all on her own when it comes to uh, Jim's heart, you know, so. Not unless we just have a situation of Ed, well, Riddler coming and Fringer. Like I said, I just get the feeling like this season will be kind of like a more harmonious union because before it's just either been Ed or like the darker side of Ed, which manifested, it's like, oh, I'm the Riddler, but now the Riddler's kind of become his own personality while he's battling Ed. And I think ultimately when the two become together, I think it's going to get to a point, and I think it's already started, that the Riddler will not know that they have become the same person. And it's like that crazy and evil mixed with the crazy and love will um, give birth to this Riddler. I don't know. I am very curious to see uh, where this all takes us. Uh, do note that there is not an episode next week, but there will be one the week after next. So do keep that in mind. And now moving on to this week's episode of Arrow, a great episode. I love what they've been doing with this season, like a lot of different directions they've been taking. Obviously, this episode being a prime example. Like for one, just talking about the title card, like with the... Uh, 
Yeah, it's like, obviously they've been doing a lot of interesting things with it, like constantly changing it. And this one, they did another change and they made it just a dragon. Because this entire episode is revolving around Diaz, I mean, him and Laurel. Because it's so interesting because the show has never, like, gave an, a villain their entire episode. I mean, literally, because I was actually wondering, I was like, wow, is this going to be an episode that literally doesn't have Oliver in it? And he's in it for, like a couple minutes, but I'm like, oh, wow, that's so interesting, like, because I thought that's what this was about to be, it's like, was it the episode he doesn't pop up in, but it turns out that's not the case, but I, I really appreciate this episode, because I, I feel like Diaz has been such a villain behind the scenes that, oh, you've seen the manipulation, this and that, you've seen him a little bit here and there, but we've have never seen him truly in action, we got to learn more about his past, because it's something, I like, the fact of the matter is, Diaz is a, like a, enemy that Oliver's never faced before. For one, he is a crime boss. Oliver has never had like a regular crime boss as a main antagonist. All his main antagonists have been like all these like skilled people, skilled archer and fighters and Damien Dark with his magic and stuff like that. I mean, to be fair, I guess the closest one to comparison would be Adrian Chase, because Adrian was just a regular dude until he basically kind of went through training like Oliver did to become the way he is. But it's like, uh, I guess, like, you know, it's basically everything that went through Diaz, that Diaz went through in his life kind of shaped him into who he is. We learned that, ba so he's actually homegrown in Starling City, apparently. That's crazy, because he actually grew up, he was in an orphanage, um, he got bullied by this dude named Jesse, who, like, burned him, treated him like garbage. It's like, wow, you are just the biggest piece of crap, aren't you? And that gave... And that's, that's what I love about Diaz, because not only is he just a crime boss, which, like I said, is just kind of in its own thing, which he, he's not even just a crime boss, he's just, he's in a league on his own, but the fact of the matter is that that's his motivation. It's like, you were a piece of crap to me, I went through a rough childhood and stuff like that. I feel like no other villain, necess I mean, I don't know, it's, it's weird, because every villain's had their own motivation. Merlin's was like, well, what happened to his wife? He wanted, the undertaking was the whole point of, like, you know, changing the city. Uh, Slade wanted revenge because he was just driven insane by the Mirakuru. Uh, Ra's al Ghul doing his own thing. Damien Dark trying to take over the world. Adrian Chase, revenge. Kind of the same thing motivates Ricardo, but kind of not. It's just, it's so interesting. He just, like I said, he just feels so different from every, because he feels like a regular dude. Like, don't cut him, cut him, and cut down anything, to take away anything is what I'm trying to say, Blah. away from his skills. Like, that gunplay this episode, just like taking dudes down, pow, pow. And his favorite move seems to beat the crap out of people with his bare fist. Like, there was that dude near the end, he beat him down a couple times, and then shot him. I was like, what the, what, why did you just, sh it's like, because I think that was something this episode also showed, too, is he has a short temper. I feel like that's something we've never witnessed until now, like, because he's always been cool, calm, and collected, like, everything going on court and plan. But it's like, this is also a nice t way to see more of our, like, and, like I said, get to really know him. Because he does not like to lose. It's like, if things don't go his way, he has a short temper, and he just gets super pissed. And in a sense, the dragon kind of is a big fitting name on multiple levels because I think because because he burns so hot on the inside like a dragon breathing fire, I think that fits him very perfectly. But it's also the fact is that the dragon is his representation of his fear, like all the fear that he lived in his life because of Jesse. Jesse put him through hell and that fear he held onto it for so long that it. He called it, he manifested it saying it was a dragon. And that dragon's been with him his entire life. It's actually the only thing that he's ever had over all these years. And so basically it seems like all DS's plans of all, everything with Star City was just the first step. The next step is to join this like huge, I guess, kind of like cabal-like organization known as the Quadrant. The Quadrant. I feel like I'm saying that wrong. The Quadrant is what I'm trying to say. I kept saying it. I would say Quadrant. The Quadrant. Um, nevertheless. Uh, what's kind of sad is, like, that one of the dudes he went to actually was like, nah, I'm not even going to bother telling the, wet, the rest of the group about your plan. I'm basically just going to take advantage of all the groundwork you've laid in Star City, and I'm going to kill you. So it's like, that whole thing ended up being a setup. I felt bad for his son, dude, because, like, Diaz, like, sent him in there, and when it when it was all said and done, less, you notice that huge blood splatter on the floor. It's like, ugh, that's, oof. I, like I said, I feel like, I feel like Arrow gets... Like, I feel like Arrow's never gotten bloody. Like, yeah, like I said, Oliver's taking some people down. But I don't feel like it's ever gotten bloody like this episode. There's even that dude that, like, uh, Laurel's, uh, 
attack, like, sit the table, and it stabbed him. It's like, I feel like this episode was super violent and super bloody. It's just, I don't know, it's just kind of interesting. It almost, I mean, to be fair, it kind of fits the tone of, like, we're not, this isn't Arrow, this is, this is the Dragon show, this is Ricardo's show right now, you know, so... But it's kind of interesting, too, like, a, a thing I couldn't help but notice in this episode, like, the fact this Laurel kind of, like, I don't know, it seems like on some level, Laurel kind of likes Diaz. I mean, to be fair, Diaz accepts her as she is, but even though she likes him on some level, it's just like, okay, fine, we're in this together, fine, I'll help you out, whatever. It's like, I mean, to be fair, it's not the type of situation she can walk away from either, but the fact of the matter is there's multiple times throughout the episode when Diaz is doing his things that... Laurel kind of looks away when he's beating, like, uh, that dude's son down. She kind of looks away. It's like, even with the way Laurel is, even she kind of thinks, like, there are points that Diaz goes too far. The whole end thing with Jesse, it's like, oh, yeah, like, I promise I'd settle things with you when I'm, uh, when I'm no longer a loser. It's like, that's literally his motivation. It's like, I was called a loser and I was, like, belittled and treated like crap. I had to... He's kind of got that street rat mentality, like kind of an Aladdin thing. Obviously, taking Aladdin and going to a super dark way with it. It's just like, oh, I was treated like a street rat. I was treated like an insect, like a slave. The fact that it matters, I had to fight for everything I got. All the food, everything I've ever earned, it was by my own hands. So, I bet you on some level, he probably, maybe that's why he kind of wants to do what he's doing to Oliver, too. Because on some level, he resents Oliver. Because it's like, oh, you grew up in this rich family. You didn't deserve this. And you've got the nerve to be out here trying to play hero. You're trying to take something that doesn't belong to you. This city is mine. It has always been mine. Because it was mine to take. Because I've earned where I am. Have you? No. You've just been around playing hero. I mean, to be fair, like, Dragon, like, Ricardo's gotten to this over the course of years. Like, to be fair, Oliver only got here, like, five years ago, you know, so. Which, interestingly enough, too, it seems like Diaz has been planning this since then, too. Like, his little takeover of Starling City, because he's like, oh, yeah, this plan has been coming together for the past five years. Which kind of brings another comparison between him and the Thinker. They've literally been planning this since the beginning of each respective show, which is kind of interesting. I also thought it was kind of interesting, too, that uh, Laurel made the comparison to um, Zoom. She's like, you remind me of the guy who brought me here. Because Zoom is one of those antagonists who was filled with nothing but hate. I, mean, I guess the same thing could be said about Adrian Jace, too. But even then, it's just like, I think it not to the level of Zoom and Diaz. Like, their hate is on a whole nother level. It consumes them. It's like, that's all. Because no matter how much he's accomplished on his own, until he killed Jesse, he, like, even when he got the title, like, oh, he's part of, he's at the table. Uh, because that dude was like, oh, yeah, you're just a thug. You're a loser. The moment he got the word losers out of his mouth, Ricardo put him down. It's like, ugh. Kind of saw that coming. Because it seems interesting. I kind of get the inkling that Ricardo isn't just going to stop there. I think he's going to take over that entire group. Because the fact of the matter is they're kind of like, oh, well, we're calculated. And you, you're just kind of like all over the place. Because it's like, because even Diaz is like, oh, what you look at what's happening in Star City, you think it's a little chaotic. You might, but it's like, no, it's this function. It's a well-oiled machine. Every, that little chaos is actually planned, constructed chaos. Because I own everything in that city. It is mine. And like I said, it's just like, he's just a little kid that's just like, mine, 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 I want it, I want it now, you know? And it's just, it's fascinating, like, because I, like, his motivations are sh so shallow, and I think that's so interesting. He's not in this for, like, world domination, like, he legitimately is just a crime boss. I love crime, I love power. Not to the same level of, like, oh, I want world domination for my own twisted reasons, like Damian Dark. It's just he's in his own lane, and I just, I think that's what makes him fascinating. But like I said, also seeing that other side of Laurel being like, yeah, I kind of don't dig everything that you're doing. Because what I'm wondering is, is this just because of Laurel's recent experiences that have kind of changed her to make her not really all okay with everything going down? Or would Laurel, the Laurel that got brought here by Zoom, the one that's kind of caused trouble in the past, like, would that Laurel be 100% okay with everything he's doing? I kind of feel like maybe she would. God, it does seem like it's probably her recent experiences that kind of have left her a little torn. She wants to play the bad guy, but I think even to a certain extent, it kind of gets a little too much even for her. But maybe that's just me. I am curious, like, when it comes to this whole situation, what Oliver's going to do. He is literally one man against what is basically an entire army. Because not only, he already had DS to worry about, but now he has this whole 
quadrant like to worry about as well that's like they're gonna back Diaz because basically I guess the groundwork he's laying in Star City I guess they're planning I guess they're gonna try and expand it and do it everywhere I guess that's kind of the plan take how he his approach his criminal approach to Star City and apply it to other places and gotta take places over bit by bit until everything's under the palm of their hands like I said it's an example using like the legends whereas the quadrant is kind of like oh we're kind of scalpels we kind of stay under the did, but we do little slices here and there but we're surgical and precise we're disciplined you are like a chainsaw you were just slashing and slashing away which kind of once again fits his personality very well too so it's just crazy once again the odds just keep stacking more and more against oliver I mean, and since we're bringing that up, there it's the other side of the episode, uh, which dealt with Felicity mainly. She's diving headfirst into this whole Helix thing because this is where Curtis ends up finding out about Team Arrow's situation. It's like, oh yeah, Oliver kind of fired me. Wait, what? Yeah, what about John? Uh, John kind of quit like a week before that. And it's like, whoa, what? And even Curtis has to admit, like on some level, he kind of gets a little joy out of it, which I'm kind of like, if I could, I stick a middle finger up to you that Curtis, like, I get it, I get it, like Renee said, like, I, once again, it's like, I'm very defensive when it comes to Oliver, it's like, it's like, yeah, yeah, it sucked on both ends, but it's like, you, like, that was, like, I'm curious to see when it comes down to what does Renee say, I guarantee you, it's, it might be a situation where Renee is like, honestly, I don't blame him too much, like, he gave me a chance, but I came at him, once again, he came at Oliver with an axe, it's like, Maybe you can make the argument like, oh, he wouldn't hit you that. I don't know, man. I just don't know. But because it actually took like I didn't like my initial thought was like, obviously, from the beginning, it's like, oh, yeah, like she's like, I need this to work. You know, Helix working out because for her, it's like for such a long time being Overwatch, like working with Oliver, being part of Team Arrow, which she's like one of the OG members, obviously. Like it's been such a big part of her life. She felt like obviously they were doing great stuff. They were doing good. And I think obviously I, at my thought was like, oh, she's trying to do all that. She's trying to make it compensate for like, okay, well, I can at least do this. I can do some good with this. Like we can do amazing things with Helix. But it's also because it was meant to decide, take her mind off the fact is because she's not Overwatch anymore. She can't watch Oliver's bag and she's just stressing because Oliver's out there alone. If he had a team and everything, that's one thing, but it's like he's out there by himself. He doesn't even have her to have satellites and cameras to watch his back. He's just going into everything kind of blind. But to be fair, once again, Oliver has done this before. Like, he started this by himself, uh, which is like, obviously, he's probably a little rusty considering the fact he's always had someone having his back. But still, he is capable. But it still doesn't change the fact this that she's stressing and worried about it, so... And it's just, it's so sad. It is messed up that Oliver puts her in that position, but Oliver's like, yeah, no, like, when it goes down in the episode, like, you know, it's like, no, no, I'm okay. You know, it's like, I made the promise to William that I'll come back, but it's like, Felicity, like, but William said it himself. That's out of your control, which he's like, well, yeah, I, the, William's 100% right about that, but like I said, it still doesn't change the fact that I made that promise, and he's like, I make that promise to you. I will always come back. So, I don't know if that's necessarily going to ease her mind or not. Like, I'm curious what Felicity is going to do. Like, obviously, her biggest uh, dedication is going to be to um, Helix. But for her, it's like, she's like, I feel useless. Which even I was like, you're not useless. You've never been useless. Like, you don't have to just be Overwatch to feel useful. Like, you are capable all on your own. You know, I know I'm kind of paraphrasing, Gary, but still. You know, so I'm curious to see what happens with that whole situation. I mean, what about the others? Like, obviously, Curtis is learning about this. He'll probably end up telling, like, Renee and Dinah, like, for a second. I'm curious, what about John and Argus? Like, what is everyone going to think when they see that the Green Arrow is out there still handling things? Will John still think the same way? He'll probably be like, well, that's good on Oliver for doing that. But it's like, hey, I still got to go down my own path. It's just like, mm, man, like I said, still rubs me the wrong way, but... Like I said, overall, this is like, a cra I mean, also, let's not forget, Oliver has basically dedicated full time. He no longer has to worry about being mayor and everything. So I'm curious about Diaz. Is he going to step into the ring? And also Watson. Once again, Agent Watson kind of, like, obviously last episode, wasn't that? Yeah, last episode, they tried to go to Watson for help, but she's not budging. So it's kind of interesting. It's like, oh, you were so hell bent on going after Oliver the moment he was a Green Arrow, but now there's a potential threat and all this other stuff you're not willing to step for. It's like we, like, legitimately, I think the last episode we saw Watson in was the Thanksgiving episode. That was kind of like, wasn't that around the mid, like a little bit before the mid season finale, or was that the mid season finale itself? 
Like, we have not seen her since. She, so she literally has not popped up in, like, um, over half the season. So it's like, you... I don't know. She was part of, like, Kate and James' plan and everything. So it's just kind of like, I don't, I don't know. I'm interested to see if, like, she ends up circling back around. Like, what's the city going to do? I mean, well, to be fair, the city's not going to be able to do much, especially with, like, Diaz got so much control of it. So many people under the take. So many people under his control. So... Like I said, the odds just don't look good, and I just don't know how Oliver was going to. Like I said, it's like things are so one sided. Between, like I said, this and Flash are heavily reflecting itself because it's like everything is so one sided against the heroes, and it's just I don't see how this is going to end positively for them. But I'm very interested to find out, especially see what the next episode has in store for us with this whole situation, to see what. Diaz continues to have up his sleeve. So I know, like, the actor, I gotta learn his name. I think that might have been his name that came first, Kirk. Um, God, it was it was something with an A. Was it, like, Asakado or something like that? That actor, oh, I love him so much, dude. Obviously, Charlie from Fringe and, um, I, you know, brought up well, Ramsey from 12 Monkeys. I always love the characters that he played. Those, like, the, like, that and now this are, like, the characters I'm gonna always know him for. It's like, he does such a good job as... Diaz, because like I said, he's just, he's legitimately like a thug, but he's so badass. And vicious, and vicious and very violent, and so, I don't know, it's just like I said, because most of his opponents have been violent and vicious a little bit, but never to the extent that Diaz is, because everyone else has always been calm, cool, and collected most of the time. He is some of the time. He talks about the long game and stuff like that, yet he has the shortest temper. Maybe that might ultimately be his undoing. That might be something that Oliver can use to kind of disrupt him. Like, obviously, it's so interesting, too, because, like, he dismantled Team Arrow. But it seems like if you push the right buttons, you could dismantle him so easily, too. But maybe that's going to be the ultimate key to kind of figuring this out. And might it be, like, Oliver would have to get the Quadrant to turn on Diaz, like, to kind of, like, stifle his power and stuff like that. Maybe Laura will help in the end. Maybe she'll ultimately come clean to Lance. It's like, okay, honestly, I've been playing you all along. I've actually been working with DS, but he scares me. Because there's no backing out of it now. Like, she's kind of neck deep in that situation. So, like I said, things might not be the way she wanted them to be. So, I do not know. We would just kind of have to wait and see how everything plays out in the next episode. But really, that's all I want to talk about in this episode. Till the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, love, light to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day and good.